Hello, my name is Magnus Johnson uh, from the University of Hull, but today I'm talking as a representative of the Nephrops project, uh, the FP7 funded Nephrops project, which is a European project that involves partners from Sweden, Norway, Ireland, Orkney, Wales and England. Um, if you wish to find out more about the project, uh, you can find us on, online either at www.nephrops.eu or you can find us on Facebook or you can follow our Twitter tag, which is uh, simply nephropseu. So I'm, today I'm going to do a sort of very brief introduction to the animal itself, which is the focus of the project called Nephrops. The animal is called Nephrops norvegicus, it's also called langoustine or scampi, Dublin Bay prawn or Norwegian lobster. So we'll, we'll talk a bit about what is Nephrops. Uh, we'll ask, we'll ask, we'll, I'll talk a little bit about how it lives, a little bit about its ecology, and we'll talk a bit about its fisheries, which is one of the main focuses of the um, FP7 project, because it's a very important commercial species. So Nephrops uh, has this following taxonomic classification. It's an arthropod. That means it has a, an exoskeleton and jointed legs. And quite often, arthropods have compound eyes. It's a crustacean. The key features of crustaceans are that they're split into regions. They've got a head area and a tail area. Um, it's a malacostracan, so it has a tail fan and it has a compound eye. It's a member of the decapods. And our decapods are characterized by the fact that they have 10 legs. Decapoda, 10 legs. Um, they have a very well-developed carapace, that exoskeleton, um, and they have their gills inside a branchial chamber. So inside the anterior area of the animal, in the carapace there, they have this sort of, uh, the, these well-developed gills. They're a member of the Astacidae, which are just the crayfish and clawed lobsters. So that's a separate group from crabs, so long-bodied de long decapods. And they are nephropsids, they're the, the nef from the nephrops family. Nephropsids are characterized by the fact that they have asymmetrical claws. So the one claw is slightly different to the other one. Uh, and they have complex sculpturing of their carapace and abdomen. So here is Nephrops norvegicus, and you can see it's quite nicely uh, split into two parts. You've got the, the thorax at the front, which uh, has the gills, and ha the head is at the, front, at the front end of the animal, obviously, uh, and it has an abdomen. Now, the abdomen is the bit that we eat, so the, this is the, the tail. Uh, would, the, the, that's the name fishermen would give to it. Um, they have uh, claws or kelepeds, and you can see these are slightly different in this animal. So this, this claw here is what you would call a crusher claw. It's a bit blunter and a bit heavier, and then the claw up here is a snipper claw. Um, they also have very well developed antennae um, at the front end that are very sensitive to uh, touch or the movement of water. And they are, well, the diagnostic feature, the feature that makes a nephrops a nephrops is the fact that it has this uh, kidney shape, very large kidney shaped eye. The eye on nephrops is much larger than average for any other uh, similar species, shrimps or, or decapods. So they're distributed throughout um, the sort of northern areas of Europe, really very important or very, um, very common in the North Sea and off the, the west coast of Scotland and Ireland, but they're also found down around the west coast of Spain and through into the Mediterranean and also found uh, up in the sort of northern areas here up in, um, up in Iceland. They tend to be found at depths of between 20, which is very shallow for them, but they're found at 20 metres, for example, in Loch Torridon on the west coast of Scotland, down to be about 800 metres, which is the sort of depth you'd find them at in the Mediterranean. So they tend to be deeper living in Mediterranean waters than they are um, up north. They're a burrow living species, and here you can see an animal uh, sort of displaying its sort of standard uh, gatekeeping um, posture. It stands with its, uh, its claws and its antennae just, stand just outside of the burrow. The burrows have a characteristic um, kind of crescent shape to them when you view them from above. And they can be very simple. It can be like one hole or two holes, or it can have four or five um, holes. The size of the burrows varies with the size of the animal. Um, and burrows are one of the tools that fishery scientists use to try and work out what the densities of animals are. And they find generally that in deeper water you have bigger burrows and animals at, at low densities or low air densities. And in shallower water, such as in the Clyde or something, they tend to be smaller animals at higher densities and with smaller burrows. You the counting burrows isn't a fail-safe mechanism working out populations though because you get variation, you get different numbers of animals in burrows, some animals have more than one hole in the burrow, and you get things like juveniles cohabiting with them um, with adults. Nephrops is what is known as a crepuscular species, so it likes twilight. So in intermediate depth waters, you'll find that the animal, so if you look at this graph here, we have day and then night then day along the bottom, and we have level of activity on the y-axis here, and you see that during the day, their activity level is very low, so they'll be hiding in their burrows. As twilight comes along, they um, increase, 
uh, in their activity levels and then they become quite active around about twilight and then they go back to bed again when it gets dark and then as dawn approaches they start to become active again they get up they're active for a couple of hours and then they'll become less active uh, later on during the day however at different depths you get different behaviors so here is an example of animals from shallow water so in shallow water you have more light at uh, depth than you do in, in deep water and what you tend to find with the, the populations of nephrops in shallower water is they're not active during the day they become much more active at night and then they, um, they towards then dawn they'll stop being, they'll stop being active they'll go back into their burrows and hide again and in really deep water what you tend to find is that the animals are active during the day in what they would consider to be twilight because there's not much light gets down to depth uh, then when it becomes really dark at night they go back into the burrows again and then they come back out again uh, during the day uh, uh, the following day so they like twilight um, female nephrops carry their eggs uh, on what are called pleopods these are the little swimmerettes that hang down underneath the the abdomen or the tail the bit that we eat um, and the, the time at which the eggs are extruded onto the, the pleopods by the female varies depending on water temperature and the length of time that the eggs take to develop and hatch also varies depending on water temperature. So you find that um, animals that are found in the Mediterranean tend to hatch and develop earlier than animals that are found in uh, sort of northern waters up in the North Sea or, or uh, Iceland for example. So the, the Reproductive cycle of nephrops is quite complex. So the, the female um, releases, uh, extrudes the eggs and they're held on the abdomen. Then the eggs hatch after a variable uh, length of time, depending on the temperature that they're in. The juveniles or the larvae then go through several stages during which time they are pelagic. They live in the water column. They don't touch the bottom and they feed on zooplankton that are uh, in the water column. And they, there's various lengths of time between them. They're quite different looking to the, the, the adult animals. They've got this sort of all sorts of spikes on them and this tail with a very well-developed uh, uh, uropod here. And they change shape as they get older. They become slightly more similar to the adults. And then at the point where they settle, they start to look exactly like uh, an adult ne um, nephrops, but just much smaller. And we think that the juveniles... Um, probably like to be in places where there are adults already. That's a sign that there's a good habitat, but we don't know whether they're attracted to the habitat or to the fact that there are other nephrops there already, that there's, um, that there's some signal given off by the adults that means that this is, this is a good place to live. Um, it may be, as well, we think that the juveniles quite often cohabit with the adults, so they may scurry into the burrows of the, of the adults. Saves making your own burrow. Um, fishing, fisheries for nephrops are managed in by uh, look, uh, uh, viewing them as living in what are called functional units. Now functional units are groups of nephrops that have uh, similar characteristics in a location. So there's a, like there's, a, there's a very important fishery called the Fladden fishery up in the North Sea and then there's a, there's a west coast of Scotland fishery. Um, and these, the animals vary in these areas. Depend, they have slightly different characteristics in terms of when they reproduce, the sizes that they reach and the, the depths that you find them at and all, all the rest of it. So, but there are two, there's one school of thought is that maybe we should manage nephrops in terms of functional units. So that means we should think about the flooding ground as a single ground and that should be managed and we should uh, manage the fishing activity that takes place there as a unit rather than managing the whole of the North Sea and saying let's, let's look at um, nephrops numbers for the whole of the North Sea. Um, so the landings of nephrops have increased significantly since 1950. So in, in the 1950s, and before the 1950s, they weren't really regarded as an important commercial species at all. Um, but since the 1950s, you can see that the landings have increased in, and increased and increased until the present level, which is about 60,000 uh, tonnes a year. And you can see that the most important landings uh, across Europe tend to be uh, those of the UK. So the UK has a, has a significant interest in this species and the, um, uh, the, land, the landings of the commercial value of the species to the UK is, is very significant. It's one of the biggest fisheries in the United Kingdom. There are two ways to catch nephrops. And one way, and the most popular way, the, the sort of dominant method for catching nephrops is to use a, a, a lightweight trawl, a nephrops trawl. Now, a this is a demersal trawl, so it just skims over the surface of the seabed and catches anything that gets in its way, really. And in the past, there have been some problems with um, discard rates uh, in nephrops fisheries. Now, discards are stuff you catch that you don't want to keep uh, and you have to throw it back again. And, and one way to get around this problem, the, the fishermen and scientists have developed a, a, tech, a thing called a Nordmoor grid. Um, and that's a grid that sits at a sort of angle inside the net just before the cod end where all the, the uh, captured prawns end up. Um, and 
the nephrops go through the grid and anything bigger than nephrops like fish that they that have got into the net, the fishermen don't want to don't want to bring them on deck, they just get bounced up into the water column again and swim off. Um, and it, that's a good thing from a point of view of the environment because it means the fish aren't um, uh, aren't needlessly killed and the, fish, the fisherman doesn't have to worry about discard. It also means they don't have to spend so much time sorting through the catch when they do bring their haul to the surface. The other way of catching nephrops is to use uh, baited traps called creels. So creels are traps that are put on the seabed. They, they generally have some sort of bait in them like um, uh, fish racks, you know, sort of fish that where they've taken, the meat's been taken off and you're left with a skeleton. Or um, the, we are currently experimenting with several other baits that could be used to catch nephrops. But it's left there for a day or two days maybe, or three days sometimes. Um, nephrops are attracted to it. They crawl in through these funnels here and they end up stuck inside the pot and they, they stay there uh, and, until the fisherman comes along and hauls the pot to the surface. Now, the, the nice thing about this fishing method is that it, the, the animals are still in pretty good condition when they're brought to the surface because the creels are brought to the surface quite slowly. So they're brought to the surface. If they're too small or not the species that the fisherman wants, he can throw them back in the water again. And the, we think the discard survival rate for animals captured in this method is probably much, much better than the discard survival rate for anything that's caught by trawl. Um, so we've done a bit of a sort of quick scoot through uh, the biology and ecology and fisheries of nephrops as an introduction to the animal. But the interesting bit, of course, is at the end, after it's been captured, and one of the most fascinating things about nephrops is that after it's been captured, it serves a range of audiences in terms of food. It can be nice, uh, really, well it's all nice, but it can be posh langoustine that's served in high-class restaurants and the value of the animal at that, uh, that, in that sort of sit setting is about the same weight for weight as the value of lobster. Or it can be the pub of, uh, the, the food of, in pubs that, that's, that are found in high street pubs all across the UK and we just call it scampi and it's sold as a breaded product, it tends to be the smaller animals from the troll uh, fishery in that case. Uh, and it's, a, it's, quite a, it's an economical food. So we've done a brief introduction of Defrops. Um, thank you for listening.